Yeah, so when I joined, I, I came from, um, I have a networking background. Yeah. I joined from, uh, I was at Foundry Networks prior to, I guess there are four years. Um, Foundry as in Foundry now, part of Brocade. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah so I was CTO there, yeah. running uh, their product development as well. Um, and, I, and, I, you know, and I transitioned to F5 because, I, you know, one of the trends that I saw was that the role of the application um, and being able, being closer to that application and enabling the applications instead yeah. of looking at it as a network issue, but looking at it as a connection between a user and the app and the services that were needed to make that app useful. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's really where I saw the trend at that time. And quite frankly, that trend doesn't change, right? It, it really is, about, except the value of the app sure. has become massively more more valuable if you look at it um, in, in the environment. So. So um, now there's been some changes in what infrastructure does. You know, switches have you know commoditized because switches now, you know, it's all about price per port. Um, so the network infrastructure itself is is important, but from a cost perspective, the shift has really been towards managing the apps, the users, you know, and um, being able to you know to manage these applications, right? That that's that, that's scaling, right? There's also been you know changes in infrastructure services like cloud. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, cloud-based infrastructure, virtualization has been a big trend. That was one. Of, that was that was about you know, cloud. When it first started, I shouldn't say cloud. When virtualization came out, it was interesting. Back in there, we started really hearing it about it by 2005. I started getting a lot of questions yeah. from the analysts saying, "Well, doesn't this obviate the need for what you do?" And we said, "No, it actually enhances the need." For, for an application delivery controller because what it's doing is it's concentrating more applications yeah. in, in a footprint, a smaller footprint, if you will, physical footprint, yeah. but but you know traffic is still going up and now suddenly applications are mobile. Yeah. Right? They can come and go, move around, do things, and now you want to be able to do things dynamically. Well that dynamicism coupled with that, you know, with that liquidity, it, it really drove, you know, the need to be able to position certain services in the network, right? And these services happen to be oriented around things like security or optimization mm -hmm. or high availability services or other things that are happening at that connection layer between clients and who are, you know, and, and accessing these different applications. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, and, and that, that trend doesn't seem to have changed, you know. The structure of applications is changing now, sure. you know, in, in many ways, right? They're becoming, the world's webifying, you know, there's, you know, and and also the, the users are changing, right? Because before it used to be either branch office or you know remote users accessing things, or your, your classic user, and typically under IT, you know, um, you know IT registered laptop, yeah. you know, that, you know, doing things. Well, now it's going to be any device, and it could be anywhere in the world at any time over any network. Yeah. You know, running any kind of app, you know, on the sure. handheld device. So, so those are some of the big, I don't know, macro changes. In the early days, uh, when I first started looking at F5, uh, I probably would have characterized you guys just as load balancer. Uh, and I was educated early on that load balancer is uh, not it, but it's so uh, passive. Uh, it, 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 it is, but you know, coming from you know the mid late '90s world, that's what we called it. Uh, do you still get to that misnomer, wh whoever you're talking to, that application delivery control is just a load balancer? And, and just to be, just give me a little bit of color from your context, yeah. why is load balancer no longer the right word, even now, all these yeah, years later? I mean, load balancing is where we came from. Yeah. You know, that we, we you know, F5 started in '96 with the proposition of being able to load balance um, services, you know, basically for web servers and scale your web server environments, yeah. right? And that was all part of the, you know, kind of the, the, the dot com bubble. Yeah. Um, um, in 2004, at the end of 2004, we released a completely new architecture, which is our traffic management operating system ar architecture, um, TMOS, we call it. And it was based on the notion of, of having a very high performance TCP level proxy with services wrapped around it. And the reason that was so important for us was that we, you know, to truly scale services, we needed access to the content in the connections that were happening. We couldn't just do it with packet headers yeah. and, and do things at layer four. We needed to have full access to the content and yeah. the connection to do things like, for example, SSL offload. Yeah. Or, or being able to proxy HTTP services and be able to insert or delete content. Um, being able to, to give visibility into the, you know to what, what the application is doing mm -hmm. or to scale it or do other things and do it at the app tier. You actually need to be, you know, you need to actually be proxy, a full proxy. And so that's that was the core value of Big IP version 9 when it came out with TMOS, was this notion of being this high performance proxy. Now, what we've done since then is we've expanded that in terms of its core capabilities, and then we've added services like security and other things on top of that. Um, but, but going back to your question about load balancing, load balancing is a feature of an ADC. 
you know, it's important because anytime you're talking about doing any kind of traffic management or steering, obviously mm -hmm. load balancing is a component yeah. of that. But it isn't what defines the product anymore. It's all the other things that it's capable of doing. So when I distill it down, I say like high performance proxy that, that's able to, to manage these session level services between clients and, and, and the apps or apps to apps. It doesn't really yeah. matter, but it's 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 Got it. that focus. And since we're talking um, well we use Linux as kind of um, as, as the foundation, but all our packet path and our proxy and all our capabilities are done essentially in a user land process that, that that's we call it our TMM, you know, which okay. is our kernel, right? So we still leverage some of the facilities that that, that like Linux provides. So you, you could say this is a Linux based system. Yeah. Um, you know, like Disk and things like that, we can leverage the Linux. But but in general, all packet path is our custom built kernel. So basically we basically when the system boots out of Linux it hands over to this and everything that happens at the data plane happens there. Uh, yeah, because I know in some of the latest kernels, three, what is it, three nine is the latest one or whatever. There's all kinds of interesting TCP acceleration yeah. tricks in there, and that will help you, I guess, as well. It would, but we don't use the TCP yeah. stack as part of that. You know, like I said, ours is um, written custom for our application. We have yeah. a double-sided proxy, and then we also do a lot of optimizations at the TCP layer to accelerate traffic. Okay, you know? and so yeah, that's all kind of our secret sauce that's in there. Understood. You, you, Linux has gotten better in the TCP stack. Yeah. But it doesn't really work for the proxy-based configurations that we're doing. We Got also it. need massive concurrency. You know, in our highest end platforms, we're close to 300 million concurrent sessions and things like that. And then from a language, the product roadmap work for TMOS features? Like, do you have this massive whiteboard and you just throw everything in there, or if you just give me a little color in the process? We have, a, we have a big database of things that we'd like to put yeah. in. We can only just put a fraction of what sure. we'd like to put in. But what drives our decisions what to put in is market opportunity, customer feedback, yeah. you know, what problems are we solving out there, and then we, we, we prioritize those, and that's and that's how we tend to do it. We also look at, you know, obviously when you're, when you're doing product development, you know, you're not... You can't look at things on a quarter by quarter basis. You got to look, you know, a year to two out or three years, depending on what functionality you plan to provide yeah. down in the future. So, you know, platforms, you know, start typically from inception a couple of years from when we actually release them. Yeah. Some of the bigger functions, you know, will, will take you know quite a bit of time to get in. So we we tend to plan those out, and you know, we run a lot of things in parallel. Yeah. But ultimately, they feed into a common code path. So, and we, we're very structured in how we how we and like you know, we try to have a regular train leaving. So new feature releases, um, big feature releases, could be anywhere from nine to 12 months. And then we'll have minor feature release cycles in between that, and then we'll have dot dot cycles or maintenance yeah. cycles in between that. So you know we'll probably have three maintenance releases a year at least. Uh, we, we always have run two code paths. We have, we have our latest feature branch, yeah. and then we have the hardened release branch, which is you know, a two feature cycle, or a feature cycle back typically. Yeah. You know, so we have, so for example, this year, just to give you an idea, we had a, the largest release in the history of the company in terms of size and scope of features was 11.3, which came out you know, last year, and that was our solar release. Um, and we, you know, we announced that, and then we also announced that we're coming out with our next feature release, Corona, which is 11.4, which isn't as big, but it's a big feature release nonetheless, and we're doing it within five months of that last release. So we're actually doing two major feature releases pretty close together just because of how things aligned and then also what yeah. the market plans are. Where's the silicon come for for that? Is that is there any of your own custom ASICs or silicon intellectual property in there? No, we don't build custom ASICs, but we do have PGAs. Yeah. So we buy from the two big vendors, you know, Xilinx and Altera, are, yeah. are big vendors there. Um, we use you know x86 based CPUs, you know, Intel's a big partner of ours. Yeah. And then we use standard you know sh uh, switches, and then we buy crypto chips and other things. But but the secret sauce, you know, you, really our secret sauce is our software. You know, our platforms yeah. enable our software to run at much higher performance levels because we're able to, to remove certain functionality from the uh, from what the CPUs be processing. So, for yeah. example, like Layer 4, we do our Layer 4 in hardware. DDoS protection, yeah. we can do that in hardware. Some forms of it hardware. Um, we do other things in hardware that offloads it. We also have special, you know, we use, the, we use that FPGA also to manage the traffic and move it seamlessly in and out of the CPU so the software isn't having to manage traffic, right? You know, the packet traffic yeah. the memory. So we, 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 we try to leverage best of breed at the right point of, of, of the product so that we can remove bottlenecks and get the broadest range Got of it. performance and stuff. Um, uh, with this recent spate of very large attacks, depending on how big you want to talk, 20 gigs, 100 gigs, whatever it might be. Has there been uh, more emphasis within your group to say, hey, look, can we scale to handle a 100 gig influx from some kind of DNS amplification attack against one of our customers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we always look at the volumetric as part of our, you know, that's a volumetric attack. Yeah. And um, certainly, you know, when you talk about doing things in hardware and rejecting, you know, these massive attacks, 
you know, it's, it's about trying to push those back. But, you know, the other piece of it, though, is, you know, the more insidious ones tend to be the ones that are out focused that don't require the mass volume of traffic to be, you know, to really knock things over. You know, like, um, one, one good attack vector that did this a couple of years ago that we protected against was Solaris. And it looked like a, it, sure. yeah, it looked like a valid web client came in, basically started stacking up connections on your web servers, yeah. and then port depletion or tipped over firewalls for concurrency. We could block that apparently. Right. Yeah, we, we push more. Well, our, 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 our focus has been this notion of consolidation. Yeah. Being able to take multiple appliances that would typically be run, multiple security appliances, and consolidate right. those down to a single footprint and provide, you know, and, and still have best breed services, obviously, but so, you know, for significant cost savings. We've done that all along with other types of services, right? We've always had this web application firewall, best breed, more awards on this. And now, and then we can do things like, you know, protecting protocols. Now we've added network level. You know, um, you know, network level um, firewall is part of that solution, and it's fully integrated together. So very high performance, fully integrated. The policies span L3 through L7, and yeah. you get that integrated view. Um, as part of, in fact, Big IQ um, will soon be supporting the ability to run multiple firewalls and have consistent policy across these firewalls and be able to manage these things. And those would be essentially virtual firewalls across each virtual subnet or VLAN or whatever we're calling in that context? Well, they could be virtual or they could be running on physical hardware. It okay. doesn't matter. It's yeah. multiple in your infrastructure. So, Because we offer, all of our products are offered in both these virtual editions yeah. running across the four major hypervisors, including, actually five if you include Amazon Cloud. Uh, and then we also provide, you know, obviously the physical appliances, yeah. you know. But what, what the value of our, our, our web application firewall is, is that it's, it's, it's able to protect um, the app by, it uses, um, it, it can actually analyze the traffic and then propose, you know, setting rules based on when you, you know, it can automatically do it, but once it gets a certain comfort level at seeing the traffic, yeah. you can then make rules based upon that, right? Because it does everything from, it, and it understands what are valid parameters, what are valid objects, yeah. what are valid paths through the application. You know, it really, you know, maps out and protects okay. the entire application, but it, it, it vastly simplifies the the, 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 po the process for building the rules, which is real important because one of the tricks of doing good application management is keeping, or application protection, is keeping the false positives low. Yeah. That's that's a very, you know, because if you suddenly get all these false positives, they'll start cranking down the well, rules the, Yeah, people like just that. turn the IPS off. Yeah, is, so, uh, you know, my biggest challenge is prioritization. Yeah. Because there's so many areas and so many interesting things we can go off and do. Um, you know, so many, t and I love that, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm still on the job. Yeah. Um, because there's just so many opportunities. The challenge, though, is picking and choosing yeah. and applying the resources to that, making sure we don't get diluted. Yeah. And that, so that's the biggest challenge, I would say. You know, but the technology and, and the opportunities in the market and where we sit, I mean, it, it just, you know, and then all the changes that are happening now in the talk, it's great. You know, it makes it a lot of fun, you know, for my role and my engineers as well. You know.